Hello, my name is Jonathan Hurst. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Agility Robotics and a professor at Oregon State University. Um, today I'm going to talk about designing contact dynamics in, advi in advance. And um, what I mean by this is anytime you have physical interaction with the world, anytime a robot with arms or legs or any sort of manipulation task is going to be encountering surfaces unexpectedly, um, it's not the sort of thing you can react to easily. So you have to create those dynamics uh, that you for an unexpected contact ahead of time. Um, and I want to make sure I acknowledge uh, Kevin Green and Jonah Siegman, especially among many others, um, but they've helped me put together these slides and prepare this presentation. So first, let me start with some example here. This is kind of a motivating example for the talk. Um, this is our version one prototype digit robot uh, at Agility Robotics. Um, and what we're doing is walking up a set of stairs, obviously, but with no perception. The robot is starting at a known location. We have a CAD model that is loaded into the robot so that the robot knows the shape and the location of the stairs relative to its starting point. But of course, as it begins to walk, the model of where the robot is diverges pretty quickly from the model of, um, you know, where it thinks it is versus where it really is diverges. Uh, and, and so there's going to be lots of error. And that's certainly um, going to happen in real life, too, as sensors are always noisy, late, and wrong. And so you see the robot stubbing its toe or missing a step a little bit. And the dynamics really have to be able to handle that, have to be able to handle that really significant level of uncertainty in the world. So this kind of base foundation level is the thing that we're really trying to get right um, before we then you know, build on all of the planning and the perception on top of that. All right. So when I think of physical interaction, um, I don't think of trying to control a particular trajectory or trying to control a particular force. Uh, it's not, in many cases, such a closed loop behavior. It's really uh, dynamics engineering. You're kind of cr trying to create a behavior ahead of time that you're going to see when you encounter something. Uh, pogo stick is a perfect example of that. You don't know when you're going to hit the ground or exactly how high the ground is. You have a general idea. But because you've got that giant spring in there, it doesn't really matter very much. And you're going to pump an energy a certain amount and, and, and keep going. Uh, I think this is a great analogy for a lot of things that happen in um, interaction with the world, in physical interaction and in manipulation and also in, in legs. So the outline for this talk, it's starting with knowing your application because you're not going to be able to design a set of dynamics for all tasks or all behaviors. Uh, really, it depends on what it is you're trying to achieve. And just like any sort of engineering challenge, you have metrics for the specific task and, and create your behavior for that task. Now, the easiest way to do that is if you can have uh, actuators that do whatever the software says and, and whatever you want them to do, and you're really creating a highly transparent, we would call them actuators. And then you can just write software um, to achieve your behavior. Um, but that's not always possible. So then you have to add some sort of passive dynamics, some sort of physical springs or clutches or you know, some trick of inertia or something in order to deal with the fact that your actuators aren't transparent enough, but you still need a particular set of dynamics. Now, maybe you can close the loop with feedback. That's a very hard thing to do with unexpected impacts uh, or any sort of very high rate kinds of things. Only works for slow speeds to close the loop around um, b because of inertia and other reasons uh, of the actuator dynamics. Now, when you're then controlling a system like this, the high level controllers don't get to dictate everything about the behavior. They uh, have to work in the context of these dynamics that you've generated, these dynamics that you've created at that low level. And thus, you have to define your action space, how it is that your high-level planner or your high-level controllers are going to communicate this action space. Uh, uh, sorry, how the high-level controllers are going to communicate to the low-level dynamics through the action space. OK, so an example of knowing your application. If you're driving a nail, of course, you want the largest possible force. You want this big impulse so that when you begin swinging, all of that energy goes into a very high force to drive the nail into the wood. Uh, you can, uh, that's very different, of course, from, from running, where 
uh, it matters a lot to minimize the peak forces on the ground um, so that you don't injure yourself. Uh, and so that as a biological, you know, um, physical system, uh, you don't have to be overbuilt. You can create behaviors such that you're not likely to injure yourself even though you have relatively small tendons, relatively weak bones, etc. Uh, and of course, if you really push your body to its limits, um, people injure themselves at very high levels of competition quite a lot. But in general, the goal here is to minimize the amount of force, not maximize it. So that's a very different application. Okay, so thinking about legged locomotion, my particular interest. Uh, features that matter. Of course, the legs are alternating. One's off the ground and one's on the ground, and you have to average mg in order to keep the body up. Uh, we know that in animals, and for very good reasons, we want to smoothly transition the forces uh, to the peak force in the middle of stance and back to zero through a contact with the ground. Uh, but we don't want that to be a discrete change. We don't want any very sharp changes in the amount of force we're applying. Um, we also know that because the sensors are noisy, late, and wrong, uh, the ground location and the properties are always uncertain and varying. So we might create a simple set of dynamics that are something like a spring mass and a phase clock, um, it, some other model, uh, but it's probably not general purpose physical interaction. You're only trying to create some subset of dynamics that uh, really don't have to capture absolutely everything. And one question to keep in mind in this that's important is like, when is the foot on the ground? In this image, we see you know, somebody running in mud. That mud is probably squishing and complying and moving throughout the entire contact phase and perhaps throughout the entire stance phase. So at what point do you side, decide you've switched from flight phase to stance phase? I think it um, really needs to be something that doesn't have to be a discrete switch like that. Okay. So in order to create the behavior you want, the easiest thing to do, of course, is to be able to do it all through the actuator, write it in software, and not have to worry about actuator dynamics or passive dynamics or things like that. Uh, in order to achieve that, you can create a very um, you know, transparent transmission that uh, you command the force, you get that force, but that has to be true for all frequencies, all speeds, all forces. Uh, of course, that's not real. You're going to have limits on the torque. You're going to have limits on your speed. You're going to have inertia in your motor, which is going to limit how quickly you can accelerate. Uh, all of these things really uh, matter. Inertia, in particular, is a big one, especially when you have a gearbox. Um, and that's just inherent in any sort of electric system, especially. So in this, this uh, diagram shows that with that gearbox, you're both accelerating that motor rotor uh, by the ratio of the gearbox, and the torque is dropping um, based on the gear ratio of the gearbox. So you're getting effectively the, ref the rotor inertia times the square of the, uh, the gearbox ratio. And so for something like a 100 to 1 harmonic drive, very easily the reflected inertia of that rotor can be larger than the inertia of the whole robot. Uh, and so you can see that at these scales, and you impact the ground, it can be a real issue. That impact can be a big deal. Um, and at larger robots, they have to have larger gear ratios. Smaller robots, the scale works really, the scaling laws work well, uh, and you can do much, much closer to direct drive, um, much, much less reflected inertia. Now, I, I've shown some videos or, or some images here of the uh, Unitree robot, the, the Ghost Robotics quadruped, and uh, the Boston Dynamics Spot quadruped, all of these robots are about the same size-ish, at least within the sca same scale. And I think that's related to this, um, this scaling law of having that gearbox and that inertia of the motor. If these robots are to get much bigger, then electric motors are going to be very, very stompy. They're going to impact the ground hard. They're going to damage gearboxes and destabilize the walking gait. If they're smaller, of course, they're less useful. So they've pushed the design up as big as they can get with the most transparent actuators they can get. But this is kind of a technological limit for electric actuators right now um, if you're going to do something like direct drive without adding passive dynamics on the output. OK, so another uh, big deal about uh, transparency in an actuator, of course, is efficiency. And, and think of it this way, if you have, you want to command 10 Newton meters and you know your gear ratio is, is what it is, I don't know, 10 to 1, 100 to 1, whatever it is, you calculate how much torque you want to apply, you apply that much torque on the output, but if you have a 75% efficient transmission, 
uh, like a harmonic drives can be, then depending on which direction you're going, you're going to lose torque in one direction or the other. So either you're forward driving it and you're only getting something like seven and a half newton meters, or it's back driving and it's actually applying like 13 and a third newton meters on the output um, if you're trying to command 10 newton meters. So that's a range of 58%. That's a really big error range uh, for a 75% efficient transmission if you're doing this as a sort of um, open loop, just commanding that torque. But if you have a 93% efficient transmission, which is in the realm of cable drives uh, and some other rolling contact kinds of transmissions, you're down in the 14% uh, error range, which, which maybe is getting closer to good enough, um, depending on the application. Now, uh, if you can do this transparency, then you can create your compliance, create all your behavior in software. And so a proportional term, of course, that's just like having a, a physical spring. If you have a transparent actuator, it's no different. It's, it's uh, force as a function of deflection. And uh, the, the D term, the derivative term, is just like you know, a viscous damper. It's just um, the force based on your, on your velocity. So in these two images I'm showing, the Ghost Robotics is a near direct drive. So they're able to do this very, very well. Uh, and in the lower image, I'm showing the Mabel robot that I uh, designed and built uh, some time ago. It was in Jesse Grizzle's lab at the University of Michigan. Um, that's a full cable drive robot. So it's very, very efficient. Uh, exactly zero backlash through the whole system. Uh, very, very back drivable. So with that, um, they were able to get the robot to walk and run around the room um, and have a lot of compliance built into the, uh, the proportional gains inside the motors. Now, the third item is when you can't quite, you know, create a totally transparent actuator, uh, you really need to add some passive dynamics of some sort to overcome those actuator dynamics. Um, and even in, in the previous slide here, these are giant fiberglass springs on the robot because the scale of this machine means, you know, this is about 160 pounds. When these feet hit the ground, that impact is a pretty big deal. And so these springs help isolate the inertia of the motor from, from the ground a bit. So I had to add some uh, passive dynamics to that to be successful. The Ghost Robotics system, I don't, I don't believe they did. Or maybe the little rubber nub at the foot is enough uh, to be the direct drive. So here, though, we look at, say, a series elastic actuator where you measure the deflection of the spring and then you control your system. Um, that only works for very slow speed kinds of things. If you're striking this with a hammer, uh, yes, the spring is going to isolate the impact from the motor inertia, and the initial impact is going to be much, much lower. And so if that's the metric, then the performance is really, really improved. The challenge, of course, is that now there's energy in this spring. And where is that energy going to go? It's going to come back out at some point. Um, and you're going to need to have your, your software system set up so that you can control that well and know that that's coming. So yes, you can add passive dynamics. Yes, they can improve the performance for some tasks. They always come with trade-offs. And so this is what I mean by dynamics engineering. You have a system that is mechanical as well as software. You need to model and understand the whole thing to create the overall dynamics that you, that you need for your system. Um, OK, so I want to show that uh, here, series springs, obviously not a good hammer. That's For a hammer, you want the big inertia. If you're isolating the uh, rotor inertia away from your system, it's going to be a bad hammer, which is great for running. You want to land on the ground and have very low initial force and have forces gradually rise and gradually drop. Uh, so in this video, I'm going to show we, we took a prototype of the Atreus robot leg and, and tried to punch through a, a wooden board. So I'll show you that. Watch it once, and then I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, you can see, of course, it's jiggling and jostling all around after the impact. Uh, because there's all these passive dynamics. Now, we don't really care about that, because when it's jiggling, then that leg is in the air, and it doesn't matter. But the thing to notice is the foot landed on the um, piece of wood right there, and it didn't punch through the board. It just stopped right on that board, and then you saw the springs load up, and then it pushed through the board. So it's kind of pushing through. It's not acting like a hammer. Um, that's exactly what happens when you have the series, uh, series elasticity built in. So it only works for the specific application that we wanted it to work for. Let's see. Now, a comparison is 
pushing a nail into a piece of wood, which you can do. <laughs> it's just not the way people usually drive nails. All right, here's a, kind of a consequence of that. Um, I'm going to pop out here and represent that. So here's a consequence. When Atreus is running and encountering obstacles, what we're doing here, because we do not have a very back drivable transmission, we have harmonic drives uh, that are very inefficient. And what we're doing effectively is Im imagine um, a pogo stick with an actuator in series, or imagine the spring mass, actuated spring mass model. Uh, we've got a position trajectory behind the spring. Uh, and that position trajectory is more or less on a clock. And yes, we adjust the clock as we run based on the, on the uh, environment or based on the speed of the robot, things like that, based on the control inputs from the driver. Um, but there's no perception here. So the robot is not seeing the environment. And what happens when the foot lands on those boards is the robot vaults up. And it can only do that. There is no way for those motors to respond and back drive. And here it even catches the toe on the edge. And you can see it vaults up very high. Um, here we go, vaults up very high and then has to come back down. So it, it's able to absorb these obstacles, but this is a little bit extreme and kind of beyond what we see from animals who are able to apply forces much more capably and don't have to um, have this sort of position disturbance when they vault up. Now in comparison, take a look at Cassie doing a similar thing. Cassie has some very nice back drivable transmissions and when it goes over the uh, obstacles, it gradually changes its height up and down, but it doesn't have to vault because we're applying um, a much more compliant behavior, which is much more about applying a ground reaction force through that transmission, uh, also still having those springs in series uh, to handle those initial impacts, um, but it doesn't have to vault. It can crouch a little bit as it encounters the obstacles. This is a lot more biological, a lot more similar to what animals do. Somewhere in 50% vaulting, 50% crouching as they go up on obstacles, depending on what they see or anticipate. OK. OK, so um, I mentioned at the beginning, a high-level controller has to work in the context of the low-level actuator dynamics. Right? We've created some, call it a pogo stick, something like that, some passive dynamics. That's the foundation. Uh, but then you have some sort of reduced order model, some sort of uh, controller that's, that's operating on that in order to create you know, whole body control, uh, the forces you want to apply. You've, you've engineered your dynamics at a low level that is a combination of the passive dynamics and your low level dynamics. Now we've got some sort of reduced order model that allows us to plan in that space. Um, in, you, know, you command something like leg length or, or stride length or, or stride frequency or um, you know, things from a high level that will allow you to place your feet where they need to be, but also have that, lo have that location both be where you want to place the foot, like if it's on stairs or stepping stones, but also successfully balance the robot and also uh, set it up so that the continued dynamics of the thing as it progresses through the low level dynamics are going in the direction that you want it to go. So it really kind of needs to be some sort of model predictive planner, two, three uh, footsteps ahead. Um, understanding what the dynamics are likely to be. Um, and then, of course, at the high levels, the user input, waypoints, task level decisions, and things like that. And I think this control hierarchy is organized by rate, as I've described here, you know, 2 kilohertz for low level dynamics, 30 hertz for updated plans, etc. but also information level. You can't be planning um, the entire dynamics of the robot um, in the whole world space. It's just too big of a problem, and it's not necessary. You can really cut down the amount of information you have at each level. I think this applies to manipulation just as well as it does to legged locomotion. There's a lot of evidence that uh, what our individual fingers are doing instead of dynamic, in, in terms of dynamics, or what our, our individual limbs are doing in terms of dynamics, there's very little information passed down about it. Um, and, and the complexity is, is um, segregated, just like it is uh, here described for legged locomotion course, the question of exactly how to do that in a robot. It's an open question for a lot of people, and it is, it's, uh, we're learning a lot and we're getting, making some progress. Okay, so in this video, what I'm showing is Cassie climbing up stairs, uh, and so that is a planner that is dealing with the low-level dynamics. And the robustness that you get is when you say plan to take two steps here, but there is only one, 
the robot misses a step, that's okay. It still, you know, balances itself. It still wants to apply some force. You see it thinks there's a step, and then it extends the leg back down onto the ground. Um, and I think this looks very much the way that a human feels uh, when, when you do something like this. Okay, so a couple of examples um, of a hierarchy. This is one that we built in my, in my lab at Oregon State. Uh, this is Kevin Green's work, uh, aiming for a kind of library of reduced order model behaviors, pushed through a learned controller so that we can actually control individual joint PD gains uh, uh, or you know, PD set points uh, for the robot. And here we are, look at the reduced order model is a simple spring mass and then applied on the hardware itself. Um, I think this has a lot of promise because you can plan through the reduced order model. Now, I don't know that this is exactly the right reduced order model. There are a lot of them out there. Uh, it comes down to computational efficiency and how realistic it is for the actual physical system. We don't want to constrain our physical system too much, uh, but this machine was built to look something like the spring mass model, so this works. Now here's a slightly different one. Okay, here we are um, using kind of the whole model of the robot and learning with uh, machine learning techniques the, the joint space uh, trajectories. This is starting with a seed of a known, um, um, you know, a, a hand engineered kind of controller for the robot, and then just using learning to kind of evolve that in a direction. Now this relies a lot on the trajectory that the robot should take. And as a result, you know, we're getting a really beautiful behavior here, but it's very brittle. Uh, little obstacles and things, um, even changes in the ground friction, um, this thing, this particular controller is quite sensitive to. And so I, that's why I say it's very important to design the dynamics that include the, um, the disturbance response. How is this going to respond with um, all the kinds of error that you're likely to see uh, in your encountering with the world. And so that's, that's ongoing research. Um, it's going pretty well. Okay, so for now a completely different uh, approach. This is not using learned policies. This is uh, the work at Agility Robotics. Uh, Digit here is tasked with picking up this box in that back room and carrying it forward here uh, into the counter. Uh, you know, like a customer counter bringing a box out of the out of the stock room, and you know we're we're messing with it a little bit, of course. Um, have to see how the low level dynamics of this thing that are operating at a very high rate, working with the physics of the robot. You see, it's swinging its arms. That is not puppeteering. The the arm swing is is part of the dynamics uh, in order to counter uh, the inertia of the leg swing and things like that. So there's a lot of the low-level stuff happening very quickly. Then the, you know, scaling on up through the control hierarchy to continuously and forever go back and forth, pick up a box, bring it out here, uh, and repeat. Now here, here Mikhail is taking that box back to the storeroom because the robot's going to keep going out and getting it over and over and over. And one more video. This is um, changing up the dynamics just a little bit. Uh, so shifting the, uh, the possibilities of the vertical, the Z direction, adding a bit more compliance in that direction. Uh, changing our model a little bit, but gives us, a, I don't know, a happier, slightly faster, more dynamic looking behavior. So there's a lot of exploration to do once you have a piece of hardware that can handle the ground impacts, that can have the transparent transmission and apply the forces that you want. Now there's a lot that you can do in software, even though, of course, we do have to work through those, those low-level dynamics. In this case, though, the low-level dynamics really enable a lot of this behavior. It's very easy to build a system for which it's just impossible to do any of this, no matter what software you write. Uh, so a lot of work is, has gone in and is continuing to go into how you build that hardware um, to integrate with the low-level control in order to generate these kinds of behaviors. Let's see. All right, with that, I'd like to finish up. Uh, thank you all for listening. I, I hope this was uh, interesting. 
Um, and I want to make sure I acknowledge the, the many, many people behind this work. Uh, my, my laboratory at uh, Oregon State, supported by NSF and DARPA, uh, and also the work at Agility Robotics. This, is, this is, picture is about a year old. The company has doubled since then, and we're continuing to grow. Um, and we are really aiming to get these digit robots out into the world doing useful things, and, and that's our mission. Uh, so again, thank you very much.